thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this is a webinar from Chelsea Green Publishing on growing great low maintenance cold hardy berry plants with Allison Levy and Scott Serrano, uh, the authors of Cold Hardy Fruits and Nuts, which was just released by Chelsea Green Publishing uh, this past month. There's a picture. Thank you, Allison. Um, my name is Michael Weaver. I'm with Chelsea Green Publishing, and I'm just going to make a few quick announcements before I turn it over to Allison and Scott. Um, they're going to present for probably around 45 minutes, 45, 50 minutes, and share information from the book and from their experience, uh, gardening experience. And there will be some time for questions and answers at the end. We're going to keep it close to an hour. We can run a little bit long. We like to keep it roughly an hour uh, for the sake of the video. This, uh, I should let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. It is being recorded now, and the recording will be available and will be posted on the Chelsea Green YouTube uh, page, YouTube channel within a week or so. And everyone who registered for this event will get an email letting them know that that has been posted. Um, if you have questions and that questions occur to you over the course of the webinar, please feel free to post them. Um, you can put them either, you can put them in the chat if you want. You can also put them in the Q&A section um, at the, which you should be able to access at the bottom of the screen, the Zoom screen. We will not probably address questions until the end of the presentation and we'll get to as many as we can, but just feel free to post them there and we'll gather them up and get to as many as we can at the end. Um, I will put some information on where you can find their book in the chat and please feel you're welcome to make comments in the chat as we go as well. Um, so just a quick word about the book, Cold Hardy Fruits and Nuts. It's a, it's a great book. It profiles a range of resilient cold hardy trees, shrubs, vines, and other fruiting plants. It, it gives taste profile information, kind of best uses, harvesting notes, uh, some natural history. It recommends varieties and gives a lot of great information on how to grow things, propagation and fertilization. It's illustrated with more than 200 color photographs. You'll probably see some of those probably this evening. And just a lot of really clearly uh, delivered botanical and cultural information based on the experience that Allison and Scott have uh, at Hortus Arboretum. So I recommend the book highly and I'll put some information in the chat about where you can find it. So quick introduction to Allison and Scott, Allison Levy and Scott Serrano are they uh, both exhibiting visual artists and co-directors of Hortus Arboretum and Botanical Gardens in the Hudson Valley in New York State. Uh, their garden began kind of as a source of inspiration and raw materials for their botanically oriented art. And over time, they developed a deeper and deeper interest, greater and greater interest in growing a wider selection of plants uh, until the garden grew to encompass 11 acres and became kind of their primary thing, their main, their main passion. And they, and they have planted over the last couple of decades a, a vast variety of plants, both edible and ornamental plants, um, which grew into an extensive collection of cold hardy cactus and magnolia trees and viburnums and grafted fruit trees uh, with a focus on rare underutilized plants. And the Arboretum is an educational organization. It's a nonprofit and a level two Arboretum. And I would encourage you to visit, we'll, I'll post the uh, the web address for that in the chat as we go so you can get inf more information about who they are and what they do and where they are. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison and Scott. Thank you, Allison and Scott, for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks thank for you having for that us. Nice, uh, yeah, wonderful. Introduction. Wonderful, Michael. I'm going to start by sharing our screen. And let me just get us in order here. Great. All, All right. right. Um, um, I'm just going to add a little bit to the introduction just to kind of give you a context of um, who we are and where we're from in our background. Um, we initially left San Francisco back in 1999 during the dot-com explosion and we moved to Stone Ridge which is in the lower Hudson Valley in New York State. And when we did live in San Francisco, we lived next to the Stribring Arboretum, which became our young daughter's playground since we lived so close by. 
so that when we came here to Stone Ridge uh, and we our initial property was three acres, we knew that we wanted to turn um, our property into an Arboretum Botanical Garden. And now 23 years later, we're a level two Arboretum with a total of, since writing the book, 21 acres. Um, about six of them are currently cultivated in the gardens, as Michael noted, our nonprofit organization whose mission is to sustain the native, unusual, and historic plant life, as well as to serve as an educational resource for the public. And um, he also mentioned, which is correct, we're focused on saving rare and endangered plants from around the world with the goal of making sure that species diversity is preserved. And this is uh, a couple of years ago, this image of our South Garden. And the talk we're gonna to do today is called Low Maintenance Cold Hardy Berries. And this is gonna cover about 15 of um, the, 50, the 50, 50, yeah, that we have. And we tried to pick some that um, maybe are a little bit more, I don't wanna say common, but people have heard of and some that you don't. And hopefully that'll be the way it goes. And we'll start off with one of our favorite early fruiting plants called honeyberry, Lanocera cerulea. And this is a plant that's both from Siberia as well as Japan. It's a honeysuckle species that is the first edible one in, at least in the Hudson Valley for us, uh, but basically for Northern climates. And it produces a sweet tart fruit. It's an extremely hardy plant and um, it's a shrub. Depending on the species in the cultivar, the sizes range from anywhere from three to eight feet high and wide. These honeyberries like um, consistent moisture, average soil is fine, um, but they do need to have good drainage. The warmer your zone is, so we're in a zone six environment, the warmer the zone is, um, the plants actually would like to have some protection from this afternoon sun. So although they do like to be in a full sun site, that is something for considering if you're in a zone seven or warmer. These are really cold, hardy plants. And these are the flowers and these should start happening at least in the Hudson Valley, I'd say what, in the next two weeks yeah, or so? Two, three weeks. Very yeah. beautiful flowers. Um, in this photo here, Scott is lifting the foliage um, and revealing the fruit that is often obscured by um, the leaves. And this is another picture of a fruit. Um, there are two different, um, you do need to have two different cultivars for pollination. And then how this has been set basically, are there early blooming? and late blooming varieties. And the early bloomings, the, lately nurseries have been selling them as sets so that you'll get two uh, different cultivars that are early blooming. Those tend to be from Siberia. And the latter ones, the late blooming are from Japan. And um, depending on where you go, you're gonna, like I said, there's a variable uh, height and the zone is zone two as well as zone three. And the late blooming varieties that are from Japan often have Japan sounding names. Like right. we had one called Blue, Blue Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. There's another one that was uh, Blue Pagoda. Right. Yeah, I can't remember what the Siberian Russian ones are, but um, so it's a great plant. This was marketed as something being akin to blueberry. And um, I think that's really a marketing thing because they don't necessarily taste like blueberry. Um, you do have to wait for the fruit to fully ripen. So once they turn this color, you're waiting about two to three more weeks. But we love this. It's really low maintenance, it frost hardy flowers. And yeah, uh, like I said, zone two to zone three. And we'll go back. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Nanking cherry, uh, Prunus tomentosa, another very hardy, very tough plant. Uh, these can be grown in zone four uh, uh, to, um, to zone two, which means they can take 30, 40 below zero, very tough. They, they require full sun and good drainage. And other than that, they're fairly adaptable. Uh, the, these are bushes that can reach anywhere between six and 12 feet. Look at those flowers. 
Beautiful. Um, most cherries are plagued by disease problems where we are, so they're, they can't really be grown successfully without a lot of spraying. This is one of the few fruits, not only that has spectacular, beautiful flower displays like this in, in spring, but is fairly pest resistant. And we, for many, many years, grew this plant without any diseases. In the last two maybe three years, years yeah. there started to appear a new problem where some of the leaves have, have yellowed and got some kind of a fungus thing that we're still dealing with. But I still think this is well worth growing mm -hmm. for a tart, sweet kind of pie cherry. Mm -hmm. A really wonderful, beautiful, handsome plant. And the bushes themselves can grow to be anywhere from six to 12 feet if you just let them do their thing. It could also be pruned down and kept sort of like more like a hedge height, mm -hmm. shorter. Yeah, it's, it makes for a really great edible privacy hedge as well. And this is the, the, there's an albino yellow form, which is kind of more like a Queen Anne's cherry, which is milder, a little less astringent. That's Luca really, one, really yep. wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, also, and, and you need two bushes for pollination and the white fruited form will cross pollinate with the, the normal red fruited form. And they're started by seeds frequently. That's so it's really good. If you get one that has a particularly lovely taste, then that seed would, because they are, the fruit could be somewhat variable. Yeah. Um, has that sour cherry flavor, I think. Really great. Spikenard, Aurelia racemosa. This is a, uh, a, a somewhat uncommon member of the ginseng family that's from the northeast that's scattered in forests, probably toward the Canadian border down through the south in Virginia, I think, and spread through the Midwest. A beautiful uh, perennial, actually, that dies back to the ground, although you can see from here, it looks like a four-foot, five-foot yeah. shrub, very kind of beautiful kind of... Um, it's often listed as being able to take full sunlight, but that isn't what we have found, it tends to get burned up. It likes part shade to full shade. That's where you tend to find this on mountainsides. It's, it's a, across the Catskills. I've seen this growing in mountainsides in the Catskills in shaded forests. Gets these sprays of, of flowers. Um, this is the same plant that sarsaparilla used to be made from. Um, the, the roots would be cooked and brewed into a beverage because it's from the ginseng family. It's also probably a nutritional but what we like about it are the berries. Um, they have a really peculiar, yeah, unique, wonderful like, flavor. Yeah. Kind of licorice, kind of blackberry, maybe a little bit of cherry. If you cook these down with a sweetener, there is a kind of a root beer, mm -hmm. kind of spicy, mm -hmm. fragrant quality that's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, again, little tiny fragile berries. That's why these are not commercially sold as a fruiting plant, but they're still wonderful. Right, you could great. see the size in terms of the scale of the hand. You know, often um, some people do like to use um, spikenard for its yeah. early shoots in the spring and they use it as a vegetable. So if you were going to go that route, you're gonna to wanna to have several plants um, so that you could harvest, so that you could still have the berries. Um, yeah, really a low maintenance, really underutilized native plant that we would like to turn more people onto. Yeah, in Japan, the shoots are called Udo. Mm -hmm. It's a similar species, the Japanese one. And again, it's cut, the shoots are cut early in, in spring and they're, I think, st well, stir fried. Yeah. They have this spicy aromatic quality too, mm -hmm. the berries do. And this is Gumi Eleganus multiflora. It's one of the first fruiting plants that we planted at the Arboretum just super lovely. It's really a tough, easy to grow shrub. And we always tell people this is the non-invasive sister to autumn olive. Um, main differences is that A, it's not invasive. B, it fruits at the, I'd say end of July, early August. And in the next three to four weeks, the bushes have uh, those flowers that it just what I showed here, you can kind of see the metallic scale started, but it's all over the leaves as well as the fruit. And that's one of its um, really stunning appeals. The flowers themselves are super fragrant and you could smell those easily from 30 to 50 feet away. And these are the fruits starting to ripen. A lot of times people who are doing permaculture um, practices 
will plant a uh, gumi as a nurse shrub in orchard settings because it is a nitrogen fixing shrub. It is multi stem, multi limbed. I guess you could prune it to have it more as a tree, but I think its form is gorgeous. The, the fruit itself tastes like a mix of, wouldn't you say, like a sweet sour cherry, yeah. like um, yeah. a slightly tart pie cherry. Uh, plants get about six to eight feet by six to eight feet, mm -hmm. uh, thrive. Uh, we have very poor quality clay soil and they thrive in that as long as it's well drained. And these fruits, you could see how beautiful they are. And one of the big things I talk about a lot is that even if you didn't like the taste of them, there's some wildlife out there that does and it's ornamental properties for putting around your landscape and your homescape, it, I just think is tremendous. It's a zone four plant. And as I think we might've mentioned, it's a roughly grows um, to maturity about eight feet by eight feet as a rounded shrub. And so it's one of the nice things about it, it's within picking reach, right? You're not having to go on a ladder to gather the fruits, it makes a great jam, great sauce. Um, it does have a, a fairly large seed compared to the size of the fruit. Um, it is edible, but you know, easy to spit out. And like I said earlier, unlike its um, uh, invasive sister, yeah. that we're not like much to our chagrin, we're not really finding like baby seedlings all over the place. I think what did we get like three over the past eighteen years or something like that. Yeah, so, and um, one shrub will feed an oh, entire yeah. family with yeah. with huge amounts of. Our 18 year old bushes or 16 year old bushes Easily. produce thousands of berries. And, and not again, only for us, but also there's birds' nests within there and yeah. the birds are happy there yeah. too. But just a beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, this is red and pink currants. Um, actually, I should include white, although we didn't put an image of that. Uh, pink and white currants are really just sports of red currant. This is Ribes rubrum. Uh, these are the early spring flowers, and although they're small, they hang in these beautiful racemes, making the shrub itself really just stunning and standing out. Again, that decorative property of edible landscaping is just, this is just beautiful. And then again, our sit has these beautiful small red currants. Um, I would, before I go to the currants, I just wanna say this is a great pollinator plant. This gets a buzz with bees and wasps and flies. So it's really wonderful that for those of you that are really wanting to create more pollinators in your area. And as I said, this is the fruit. Um, both the naturalized and introduced cultivars from Europe have these small but very tasty fruit. Scott tends to like them out of hand. I tend to like them more cooked, uh, but you know, either way, this is a very pest resistant, really. I, I, can you think of something that's bothered this other than birds no, maybe? Not really, not yeah. really for it's us. Fairly adaptable to soil, mm -hmm. um, part sun to, to full sun. It, it actually can even take like poor fer fertility, but one of the things that we talk about and you see it in our book a lot, is that we really believe in giving fertility for fruiting plants. We think it helps the fruit flavor as well as um, makes it more productive. So these thrive, yeah. these thrive with well-aged manure and, and potash for out mm -hmm. of a fireplace. Those two things are the traditional way to mulch the roots, mm -hmm. which also helps to keep the roots cool during the growing season, so. And it's a zone three yeah. plant, so definitely cold hardy. And um, bushes tend to be, between four and six feet high, rounded. Um, this is the uh, sport called a, a pink champagne currant. These, I would say you could eat out of hand. Yeah. These have a much more sweeter flavor. And I think the Blancas, the white ones yeah. do as well. Those remind me of pomegranate, actually mm -hmm. the flavor, really yeah, wonderful. Delicious. Those are actually from the 1700s. That cultivar, pink champagne is mentioned in the 1700s in literature. So. That's a very ancient one. And you can see this bush is covered with strings of the currants, just Champagne lovely. Again. Yeah, and they, they'll stay for a while unless you know you Birds. have a big bird population <laughs> yes. who finds out about them first. Uh, I love mulberry. Um, we love mulberry. Yes, um, we do. Most people have had the wild species of mulberry and they will often think, well, who cares about that? 
um, because white mulberry, which is an invasive species, can be kind of insipid sweet, and red mulberry can be kind of mediocre. This is Illinois everbearing, which is a cross between a white and red, and this approaches the flavor profile of a Mediterranean mulberry, which is wonderful. Um, I just want to say the image that you're looking at, this is a fairly young tree. They are fast growing in their early couple of years of life. What would you say was this year, like six or seven? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. These can so. ultimately reach between 30 and 40 feet. Mm -hmm. um, this particular cultivar kind of gets about that large. Um, Beautiful, handsome leaves. So this is basically a grafted variety of mulberry. And those are the flowers beginning to to start on the fruit. And this is technically not a berry. Mm -hmm. This is an mm -hmm. aggregation of droops. Um, Actually, many of the plants that yes, we're talking about are, fruits that are not really berries, but that's what we call them. This plant's adaptable, can thrive in many types of soil, does great in the Northeast, very generally trouble free. Mm -hmm. The fruit is remarkable. Um, to me, I, I always liken it to the flavor of tangerine and blackberry. A good mulberry should have a complex flavor that you can't quite pin down. Often it has a sharp, spicy bite with a lot of sugar. That's the mark of a great mulberry. And this again is Illinois everbearing, and that's called everbearing because it double fruits. It will literally produce two crops over a period of two and a half, three months. Yeah. The only with a heavier crop in this in the, the, the in the yeah. early summer. The, really, the yeah. only proviso of this is this will eventually produce thousands of berries. And if you <laughs> walk on those and walk into your house, you yeah. will cover your floor mm -hmm, yeah. with berry juice. Yeah. So it's best for this to be planted away from the house. Mm -hmm. The best way to, to harvest these is to put a sheet. You don't mind getting dirty on the ground and just shake the tree and all the ripe berries drop into right. the sheet. Right. Um, great plant. Uh, zone, zone five. Yeah, although there are some cultivars that are cold that hardy. Are colder yeah. hardy yes. so for sure. Um, Juneberry, Amelanchia. Um, Amelanchia is, has many, many different common names at the very least. We're gonna call this one Juneberry, but um, depending on where you are in the United States or in Canada, it could be known as Shadblow, as Serviceberry, Saskatoon, as well as Shadbush. Um, in general, June berries are relatively easy plants to grow and they tolerate a wide range of growing conditions. I mean, really wide range, um, as well as the soil type. The one thing we do say is that this does like to have um, a well-drained site and it does like to be in a full sun site as well. Uh, these are the early spring flowers, really just beautiful. Um, could see on this tree like here it's cherry, just, very pretty just stunning and last if you have a cool spring could last for several weeks which is quite lovely um let's see what to tell you about the fruit well this fruit actually is unusual in the sense that i see it basically ripens all in like a one week to 10 day period of time and somehow the birds know this too so you're kind of in this thing of waiting for fruit to ripen. And here you could see toward the bottom left, those fruits are not quite ripe yet as the ones toward the back that have that more deep purple. But in any event, even the red ones, they, they have this flavor that is, I don't know, akin to like apple with some berry with an almond finish. And that almond finish is coming from the seeds that they're fairly large seeds considering the size of this fruit. And the, the flavor is remarkable. It's almost, some people say it's too sweet. Um, I, I kind of think of it as like a blueberry stuffed with mm, diced almonds yeah. or a cherry stuffed with yeah. diced almonds. So when your tree is happening and, and we're finding our trees right now seems to be producing fruit every other year. I'm not sure if that's, and this has been with us for about, I don't know, a dozen years. Um, environmental conditions might be causing it not to fruit um, consistently, but when it does- The birds you, know it. Yeah, so I'm up on a ladder, I'm grabbing the fruit. Um, oh yeah, here I am on the fruit and just spending hours just picking, um, which there's not really an easier way to do it. But I think this is a really worthy tree. And as I started off earlier saying, there's all these common names and that's because there's all these different species. So 
if you're out on the West Coast, you'll have, um, they tend to be more shrub-like and definitely like the full sun. And then on the East Coast where we are, you'll tend to see those more as an understory tree, um, you know, in forest clearings. The growing heights can be anywhere from four feet to as 25 feet or larger if the plant is happy. Um, generally speaking, they're zone four. Uh, I know that Emelanchia canadensis is its own three plant. And what we showed you that we're growing here is called Autumn Brilliance, which is a great hybrid. Um, there are the only drawback I would say to this, besides the irregular fruiting, which could be just incidental to hortus, is that there are some disease issues can, like rust and fire blight. So just being conscious about where you plant and being aware of that as well is important. And, and a full sun site tends to be yeah. produce cleaner fruit. For We've sure. had things in more shade and though uh -huh. the forest, <laughs> they, they occur in the forest in shade. Uh, in our environment, they can be quite disease prone right. in shade. Black raspberry, Rubus occidentalis. Um, these are the wild black raspberries that occur, occur over large parts of the eastern seaboard. Um, they can grow anywhere from 10 to 15 uh, uh, feet long, the canes each season. Um, we have a, a hybridized bread variety, which is almost double the size, yeah, which is called Allen. Um, we think this is a really, really wonderful, great American fruit. Um, I think the wild species are a little bit more rich, the flavor, but these are so abundant. Yeah, I'd say so these large. make up in yeah. size, like yeah. you, you don't even know. Incredible for, for canning mm -hmm. and for making jelly mm -hmm. and really phenomenal. Again, not a true berry, but yeah, who cares? Yes. Who cares? Um, it's a delicious berry. Um, as a general rule, mm -hmm. these do not like competition from wild yeah. grasses and weeds. So keeping the plants weeded and uh, giving them compost. Again, they're like the wild species. They'll grow in almost anything, including shade. But if you give them full sun or a lot of sun and a fair amount of compost or aged manure, they'll reward you with thousands and thousands of berries. Really wonderful. And you know what's crazy is that it, like in the 1920s, there were over 200 different cultivars available to the public to, to buy. And nowadays, I mean, we're lucky yeah. if there's a dozen. Um, Red raspberries basically yeah, has made kind of, out in the marketing right, world, basically right. displaced this as a And nothing wrong crop. with the red raspberry. We love them. But like there's something so quintess Qu quintessential, quintessential about this summer. berry for yeah. summer. Yeah. These are like summer, yeah. dead Delicious. summer. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, yeah, you talked about height as zone five. Some cultivars I've noticed could go as low as zone four. So depending on where you are, you might want to just keep that in mind. I know that there, there's, um, besides Allen, I'm trying right now. There's I'm, a whole bunch. There's a them. whole, yeah. well, not a whole bunch. There's not 200. Uh, like No, were, I think there's I probably, probably commercially available about a dozen yeah, different. Yeah, I guess that's a lot these days, right? Blackberry, uh, cousin or sister mm -hmm. species of that. One of the many, many um, blackberry varieties. We love wild blackberries, but um, they're yeah, much more do. prone to disease. So I often recommend people pick like Oops, sorry. what we're you, what this is, which is which is triple crown. This is yeah. a thornless variety called triple crown that produces, as you can see, oodles and oodles of flowers and berries. Very large, giant um, black raspberries, very blackberries. Excuse me, really good. Um, they're not maybe quite as rich as the best um, wild blackberry, but they're very very close. And without having thorns, they're great. Uh, as a general understanding, um, blackberry canes can grow 10, 15, 20 feet long. They can be pruned down the first season to kind of shorten them the first season. And they, we actually put a lot of information in our book about yes, how about to take care of them and take care of them. and yes. flora yep. canes. So yep. it's a good reason to get that. Zone five-ish, mm -hmm. sometimes a little bit more cold hardy than that. The thornless varieties are a little less cold, cold hardy. Um, some blackberries are much more cold hardy, more like zone four or three. I will say that these are self-fertile plants, but you know, if you're like us and you really like your summer fruit, it's you could start with one plant and then layer in, but um, the tips, the and tips it, of them, start them. But yep. you, this is one that really 
it would prefer to be in a full sun site much um, less disease much less and well drained yeah. and given yeah. like a good compost or leaf hummus or even really well aged manure just to kind of get it cranking in the beginning of the season and that's triple crown. And there's a giant one up here that we have forgotten the name of. Yeah, that, that you're going to see uh, very soon. And that's triple crown too. And it's also just show you the diversity yeah. because we have three or four different cultivars. Yeah, these are so all thornless see. varietals. And just to show, um, and also in the book, we talk about strategies for how to take care of them, meaning trellising and or having a wild patch and how to take care because they are going to need some sort of support. And those are the Look giants. at the size of those. We got to figure out which yeah. plant that came from. Yes. This. So silly. It's great. Uh, Cornus moss, cornelian cherry. Um, I just actually posted about this uh, the other day. This is a great plant that's in the dogwood family. It could either be a multi-limb tree or shrub. And I'd say right now in, um, in the Hortus Gardens, this is what you're seeing on the plant. It's the buds just starting to break. And hopefully next week we'll have these bright early yellow flowers. Um, sometimes when people don't know any better, it's understandable for them to think that this could possibly be forsythia, which it is not. Um, such a much more important plant than that. Beautiful yellow flowers. You might get some early pollinators on that. You do need more than two plants. You need more um, than one plant. I'm, I'm sorry, you, thank you. You do need more than one for uh, fertility. And we had started with the straight species and have a couple different cultivars. And over time, we have really leaned heavily into having cultivars. Um, this particular cultivar you're looking at is called sunrise and it goes from a yellow with a blush and then will turn to red very handsome low maintenance plants ours are actually planted in really a part shade where it's getting summer it's getting sunshine in the morning to early afternoon but I think it would be a lot more productive and early ripe like ripening earlier in the the age of the plant if it's in a full sun Ours took maybe eight years until they really started producing fruit. So, um, but if you are someone who doesn't have a lot of sun on your site and you wanted to put in a couple trees um, or, you know, uh, multi-limb shrubs, th this could be a great plant for you. Also, if you like a cherry, a mm -hmm. very high yeah, quality cherry, flavor, right? because yeah. this is like a cherry but it is mm -hmm. not from the family so it right. has none of the disease problems That's in right. fact these have have never been hit in i don't know 18 years yeah, never nothing. been hit by any problems yeah and trees can be anywhere from 15 to 25 feet in height and it is a uh, zone four to zone five again depends on what cultivar and this is a mix of uh the sunrise and the yellow and maybe some straight species, but probably not because they just don't have that sweet sour thing. Gooseberries, uh, the sister species to currants, same growing conditions, part sun to uh, full sun, um, likes, likes a yearly application of aged manure and compost, uh, attractive shrubs, uh, fairly pest free. There's only one major problem. There's a current worm that can kind of defoliate the plants midsummer. But other than that, there's no other major problems. And you get rid of current worms, you can just kind of rub them off the plants with your fingers. Um, very cold hardy zone four. Some some are even more cold hardy than that. Uh, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, there are hundreds and hundreds of cultivars traditionally. Now there's less mm -hmm. available, but there's still probably a good 15 or 20. Um, we love Invicta, um, and that's coming up very soon. Uh, that's probably John's Prairie, John's yeah. Prairie. You'll notice there's no thorns on yeah. that. Gooseberries have thorns, but this is an almost thornless variety, Jan's Prairie, e exceptionally sweet and delicious. But even with thorns, <laughs> <laughs> and there's and there's the native giant wild silk moth. So we actually love silk moth. So that's a giant we were silk moth. Yeah, with this, I think it, was on the jewel. Yeah. yeah, like okay, whatever oh, we need yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, and that's an in, Indicta. That's an English variety. 
Um, and even with the little hairs, you don't even get any of that. I mean, they're like Scott said, super sweet, but you see the size of those thorns. Yes, right? and so this is a standard thornless, thorny variety. Mm -hmm. uh, plants can get anywhere from three feet to six feet, depending on the cultivar, how you crop it and, and prune it. Uh, fairly pest free other than the current worm and, and mature shrubs can be loaded. We think that's Tixia, mm -hmm. you can see. And this is a variety of different gooseberries kind of picked at one harvest. And generally I would say they're a zone four plant. Yes. And we have ours sited in full sun. And the only caveat to doing that kind of thing is because we're not actually giving them um, additional irrigation in the summer. Plants do get to look a little tired looking. So if you're in a, a zone that's warmer than six and you're interested in planting this, you might, you definitely do want to put it partially shaded for the hottest part of the day and it, it's probably yeah. a good strategy even if you're in zone six right? in zone six yeah. yeah yeah colder could be more sun mm -hmm. again our our plants get a little fried they produce thousands of berries but then next spring they come back and they're mm -hmm. fine they just sort of go to sleep when it gets hot and then here it is a mixture of both sweet as well as like so we call that eating out of hand right as well as cooking varieties, which are some of the darker ones towards uh, um, the bottom of the screen. Good, good fresh varieties for fresh eating again are Jan's Prairie, J-A-H-N, it's a person's last name, and, um, and Invicta. And then a good, um, a good um, cooking variety that's tart is Hinamaki Red and- uh, um, And Jewel, and I, like. Jewel. I think Jewel, Jewel is great for cooking yep. as well. Ah, uh, so this is Aronia. Um, it has the very unfortunate common name of chokeberry, and we'll talk about that in a second. These are the flower buds going to open, and when they do, again, the decorative quality of them is just amazing. Just a very beautiful low maintenance shrub. Um, this is a suckering shrub that spreads by underground stolons. And it is one of those that has a really wide range of soil conditions that it can tolerate. So we've seen these on the edges of wetlands, we've seen it in forest shade, rocky ledges off of mountain areas, as well as waste areas. Um, so I would call this a very adaptable plant for um, anyone's garden. And you could start to see the form of the shrub. This is still fairly young. I think it's maybe three or four years old with the fruit starting to ripen. And um, the, the ones that we're seeing more in nurseries is Aronia melancarpa, um, but we're finding also things are often mislabeled. And so you could start with the, what you think is a Nero or a Viking cultivar and find that it's something else. But the melancarpa is basically has some of the sweeter fruits so again, that name of chokeberry is because most people find this a very, very astringent um, berry. Like Scott is not a fan of it, eating it raw. No, I'm not. I, if I find some good ones, I think they're delicious. Other ways to do it are to freeze the fruit or to what we find very successful is dehydrating them. Um, most of the times they're used in um, production for mixing in with other fruit juices, just because these have um, really, really high levels of antioxidants of really most fresh fruit, most fresh fruits that there are. Zone four, pest free. And um, I think this really should be planted in more people's gardens. I think it's just a great low maintenance shrub that wildlife adores if you do not. Just showing a couple different looks of different types of berries. Again, the fruit's ripening. This is a cultivar called Lowscape. Um, we're still on the board. We're not really quite sure. We haven't had fruit from this. So you just kind of- you know, It's being not, experimented you know, with. Yeah. Sea berry, sea uh, buckthorn, hippophae rhamnoid is, uh, this is a great, incredible fruiting plant. The one major drawback is, is that it is hyper aggressive. Uh, this plant can actually run 20, 25 feet and send suckers up for 25 feet. That being said, <laughs> if you have a place you want to colonize, I say that because a lot of permaculture people recommend this and people stick it in the middle of a typical yeah, garden oh and they don't understand that it will take over their garden. 
Um, so you, with that proviso, if it's in, a, in the right spot, it's, it's an incredible plant. Plants can get um, up to maybe 16, 18 mm -hmm. feet. There's mm -hmm. some cultivars that are maybe eight feet. Mm -hmm. uh, the boys tend to stay put and you're looking at a boy because it's very difficult to see what the flowers are like in the and the girl flowers tend to run and those are the ones that are like bamboo. And those are more boy flowers with a, the strange little kind of russet colored scales opening. And that's gr girl fruit and flower. And my wife put a little- uh, <laughs> So you can see the little fruits, to and, they're and so hard to see. that's why people yeah. go, I don't know uh, if I have a male or female plant, because you need time, both right? male and female. Yeah. There are dozens of cultivars. These grow everywhere from the Himalayas and rock ledges to pure sands in like Siberia, um, very adaptable. Uh, the fruit is an, is really remarkable. It has huge amounts of vitamins, including like A, E, K, um, as well as some really yeah. high levels of C. It's it's like, much more nutritious than, than oranges in terms of vitamin C per mm -hmm. weight. It's quite extraordinary. So this is used as an athlete's drink in Eastern Europe, and also now it's finding its way into skin creams because it's very good. For I saw skin. little bottles at a juice shop in Manhattan that were selling for ten bucks to add into your health drink. So it's it's. It's getting into its a market now. People realize, and they're look at the fruits; they're beautiful. The, I mean, the the, the the shrubs do have very painful yes, thorns. You do. have to pick around them. Uh, the fruit can be made into a juice. To me, the the it's akin mm. to passion fruit orange juice. It's orange with kind of a, a a berry flavor. It's really wonderful. I would have said like tang, but yeah, just great. And um, I tend to use the leaves uh, to make a tea and I use them either fresh or dried. And that is something that a lot of people don't realize with this plant. And very similar to the Gumi has these really interesting scales that cover the entire, every aspect of this plant. So zone yeah. three, Arctic, very, very tough, very resilient, the, can grow in bad clay. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, 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 the limiting factor is it must be in full, full sun. sun yeah. this, can, this, can, this dies and declines in shade and needs well-drained soil and full sun. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, it's pretty adaptable. Mm -hmm. Five flavor berry, Shizandra chinensis. And here you're seeing the image of the fruit starting to ripen. This originally was, um, uh, was marketed as magnolia vine um, at the turn of the century. And it's, you could see these flowers do indeed look like little magnolia flowers, but they're teeny but it's a great vine. You can see the fruit there is developing. Um, this is an image from a cultivar that is self-fertile. It's called Eastern Prince, but in its natural environment, the plants are dioecious. So they're either male or female. And you're seeing an image of the fruit starting to ripen during the summertime. And you could tell that it's on a, well, I don't know if you could tell, but it's on a cedar post. Uh, so you do want to have some support system for it and an image of the fruit. So I, I mentioned its common name is five flavor berry and it's known for its sour, sweet, bitter, warm and salty taste. And it's considered one of the 50 fundamental herbs for Chinese medicine. In the US it's often sold as a health food supplement in its powdered form. And I'd really love to see some farmers growing this because pretty much all of the berries that are found in health food stores are from farms in China. Um, beautiful berries hide mostly under the illustrious foliage, which I guess is kind of good. So um, birds aren't seeing them. And this is a form uh, again on a cedar post, just kind of showing it, this could needs to be in a part shade. Yeah, yes. it cannot be in full sun. It'll be scorched. Yeah. The, so this is one of the few plants which will produce huge amounts of fruit in part mm -hmm. shade. It's mm -hmm. really great. And although Scott doesn't like the fruit fresh as I do, um, I tend to dry them. I eat them fresh. Scott will use the fruit and make either like a drink that is akin to pink lemonade with a little bit of sweetener and not just taste but color as well and when people try it in our gardens they're like 
wow what is that yeah so it's it's, it's lemon lemon peel with a berry finish it's very interesting and similar to and similar to sea berry it's it's used as an athlete's performance yeah. drink yep. in both china and russia zone three so super cold hardy and uh, this is our the last yeah, our one last, himalayan yeah. chocolate berry lycestra formosa and uh this is a marginal plant in the south this grows as a large shrub here it'll tend to die back to the ground over and over um uh, zone zone six sometimes it can be protected and kept mm -hmm. a little bit um more for farther north than to zone five but yeah. it's more zone six really remarkable interesting bracts these strange Purplish purple green, bracts yeah. with, with little white flowers and this is more of a curiosity yeah. taste. You can't be fed off of this, but the flavor is distinct and unique. I'd say it's like um, bittersweet chocolate and mm. blackberry. That's why it's called Himalayan chocolate berry sometimes. Um, very, very interesting as a kind of a nibble fruit. Um, and it's also just a very beautiful, attractive plant. This was put in Ireland in the 19th century and in Europe, and it became an invasive yeah. species. It kind of overtook their forest, and so it's now zone, a noxious weed. So I weed. think anything yeah. warmer than zone, zone six, six should not be planted. Yeah, yeah, planted with the caveat that you have to be deadheading when these yeah. uh, fly, when the they're forming fruits. Where, you know, where we are, these have never had a problem, but because they're killed to the ground and kind of start again as a perennial, so they're not a problem. But in a warmer climate, it's like yeah. zone eight. This is probably a problem. Plan. And they appreciate full sun. And the, 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 the interesting is they start fruiting toward the end of summer and will go straight through till frost. And the taste of the fruits are really unusual. They go from being like burnt caramel to red wine to chocolate. What else do you get? Like caramel. Those, some yeah. people say like almost a burnt caramel. Very it's interesting. Delicious. Plants grow six to six, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, adaptable soil likes kind of mulch little compost but mm -hmm. fairly easy to grow mm -hmm. um, member I of the just, honeysuckle family yeah, again and just really beautiful the one on the left is the straight species and i believe the one on the right is uh the one and only cultivar called golden lantern so the foliage is a little bit more uh lighter in color a little yellow and um, that's the end of this presentation, but there's many more um, fruits and nuts. We didn't even cover nuts, but many more fruits in the, um, our book. new book um, published by Chelsea Green Publishers. And it's available through their website or any fine bookstore. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much yes, for, for, attending. for attending and we'll stick around and if there's any questions. have any questions, yeah. Thanks so much, Allison and Scott. That was great. Um, it's got me thinking about things I might add to my garden. There are a few other questions, though, so I won't ask mine until I've asked some other people's. Um, one that came in about spikenard, which was one of the earlier plants that you talked about, um, and, and how easy it is to source that, and whether there are any medicinal uses or qualities for that plant. I'm that sure there are, are, because it's from the ginseng family. Yeah, I, medicinal I, I don't, wise, yeah. I, it's been used as traditional Native American food for a long time. Um, there are places, I, there are several um, places that specialize in, in native plants. Um, I'm forgetting the one that I'm thinking of, is it Prairie Moon Nursery, that sells baby plants reasonably, mm, so you could, get, yeah. you could get little seedling baby plants. It is easy to grow from seeds. I've mm -hmm. taken seeds, so sometimes this is one of those plants that you can take from seeds and get plants started. Yeah, from if you're them. foraging and you see, yeah. happen to see you it, you could take the berries. Yes. Great. Um, we had a couple people ask about deer issues, um, yeah. uh, commenting on whether any of the any of the plants that you mentioned are gonna resist or be resistant to deer at all. Someone else said they have deer and woodchucks aplenty, and are there any fruiting shrubs that yeah, do better than the, others, or tactics all, to discourage deer? Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, things that are wait woody. tactics for deer <laughs> fencing. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I needed to say that. Um, and, yeah. and sometimes we've put in orchards for people and they don't want to have fencing. So what they do is they get the four foot deer fencing that you can buy in rolls from a hardware store, do a 12 foot long piece, cut it, 
sew it into a big circle yeah. with a few rocks on the bottom to hold it. And that will keep things off for two or three years till the plants get bigger. And then you can pull this sort of hoop off the plant and let it go. So the plants can't demolish it. They can just kind of nibble on the edges. I mean, something like spike nard is probably because it does spicy. grow. And yeah. it does grow in our native forests on the East Coast. That's probably sweet. is less likely. Yes. And the amelanchia, if you were to go for, you know, one of the one of the crosses, like what we showed the autumn brilliance, that as a young tree could go the route of what Scott mentioned about protecting with a little, uh, cage, a metal cage around it for a couple of years until the canopy goes high enough. And so that if some of the branches, you know, ex, it, it, you know expand past that enclosure, if they get nibbled on, no big deal because the upper ones, but- And, the, and yeah. as, as I mentioned, sea, sea buckthorn yeah. is formidable. Yeah. Once that grows for a while, it yeah. becomes a monster like bamboo. And they, it would take a whole herd of deer to eat it for weeks to completely wipe it out. If it forms into a thick trunked plant that's tough and it's got thorns, so it's not easy mm -hmm. for them to get into it. Mm -hmm. So if you can protect a few of those till they get to be big plants, they can probably survive deer nibbling. Yeah, it's hard because deer eat things that they're yeah. not supposed to, right? Yeah. Whether Rose they're, bushes. you yeah. know, may apple, those are highly toxic leaves. But depending on how, what the, you know, the, the pressure is from your particular family yeah. of deer, you could always try one time planting it and just seeing what happens. And then if you see something's getting hit, but something, for instance, like um, the honeyberries, since they tend to, um, when they're, you know, at their full potential, when they've grown out, they're not going to get any larger than six feet. So that might be something that you couldn't protect without having some sort of um, fencing or yeah, caging sure. around it. It's a tricky one. Yeah, yeah. I just did cages around my plum trees here in the, in the, in the town where we live because deer wander through and just hit our, hit them enough. And the cages mm -hmm. have worked and we've just taken them off. We think they're big enough that they'll survive. Yeah. So. yeah. Some, someone else speaking of pests asks about invasive jumping worms, whether, and asks whether you have any advice about those. Um, you know, I was just asked um, today by someone. So unfortunately they're here. There are a lot of studies being done through Cornell and some other university extensions. Jumping worms, to the best of my knowledge, really don't present themselves until summertime, which is really when we start to see them. And if you have the fortitude, you could start to, there's, there's lots of great resources online, even though they're still trying to figure it out. But you can solarize them, which means putting plastic and heating it up, and that tends to kill them when they come to the surface. Um, I, you know, they are doing damage, damaging um, work in our forest in terms of, you know, taking that top layer of um, leaf mold and soil. And so I I but, haven't noticed uh, yeah. where we are that there is they're, they're, they're fatally yeah. killing trees. I've yeah, heard people not, saying right. that they do cause trouble. I can't remember seeing a plant that in they the woods destroyed. right now. Right. I know particularly. I I remember a long time ago reading a thing about the the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes regions, where people have dumped their their fishing bait for hundreds of years. Well, not and, hundreds. But well, yeah, where whenever hundreds. people were fishing, mm -hmm. they would dump their bait like mm -hmm. night crawlers and stuff. And there's those areas are decimated because the worms have literally taken six inches of the topsoil off. They've eaten everything. And the really crappy thing actually is that chickens tend to not like them. I have grown um, my jumping worms in there and they're like, uh-uh. So... <laughs> Yeah, I think this is one of those, you know, we just have to be patient and hopefully some university extension is going to come up with some fix. But yeah, they're mm. Mm. two tough questions in a row. Yeah. I don't really passed. have a great answer for them. <laughs> Somewhat, maybe this is an, an easier one. Someone else is just asking where these plants or seeds can be purchased. Someone based who lives in Western Mass. And I know there is, there is a, uh, appendix in the book that shares some source oh, yeah. material yeah. for these plants. Yes. But, and we yeah. order from everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, online fruit 
trees, local nurseries. I mean, I've even gotten things at places like Lowe's. Yeah, your, I mean, you know, yeah, your local at, box er, store. Everything. I will say because of COVID the last couple of years um, that we've noticed because we do um, a lot of landscaping that um, the amount of material that's actually available has shrunk while the actual audience of people or buyers has grown Demand exponentially. Has grown. Oh, so, yeah. so there's just, no, you know, and plants grow slowly. So there's so, only so, so much so available. So here's the secret. When I order things. Okay, Anderson. <laughs> when I do things, I, I order them in the middle of winter. You don't order them now. By now, everything's sold yeah. out. And apple trees, there's a thousand people producing apple trees. Yeah, you can However, that, pawpaws right? and persimmon trees, which are among our favorite fruit, there's only a handful of places in the United States doing those. And those all sell yeah. out fast. So mm -hmm. order early. I mean, if you live around Hortus Arboretum, we do do a sale um, around Memorial Day. So you could check in with us. You can sign up on our website. We don't have tons and tons because we're not a nursery, but we have so many plants. We grow all these 50 plants plus more in the garden. So sometimes we do have stuff, but it's tough. So I would just even look at, like Scott mentioned, just even look at your local box store and you'd be surprised. We've even seen, did we see a persimmon one time sold at a I, I don't think so, or? but blueberries are oh, often yeah. there, cherry trees. Um, Juneberry, yeah, June for sure. Yeah, yeah. shrubs. Yeah. Of, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe even honeyberries might happen soon enough. Great. Um, I have a question. I, I'm looking for something that produces edible fruit or nuts that ideally would be evergreen for screening purposes. I have a small backyard that I'm landscaping and I'm, I'm zone eight, so I'm not super, I don't need super cold hardy. Do you have anything? Uh, monkey, monkey puzzle trees, monkey puzzle trees, Ericaria are traditional nut producing apparently very, very good, like pine nut, um, very, very good. There's also, we in our book, there's um, Korean stone pine. I don't uh, know if he's, if he might be too warm. No, so no, I don't know. think so. No, that's Korea, a great Korean plant. stone pines. When you eat panoli nuts from like a supermarket, when you get them, you're actually eating Korean stone pines. Yeah, uh, Ital Italian, Italian. Italian ones are long and thin and they're more expensive to get. So a lot of the stuff is imported from China and Eurasia, and those are Korean and they grow fairly fast. So yeah. that's another, it looks, it would be difficult for you to distinguish between that and a white pine. Yeah, Similar, absolutely. if you like white pines, it's a pretty ornamental as a background, like mm -hmm. in the back of a tree, mm -hmm. uh, in the back of a yard, if you want to frame it with some large pine trees, those would be great. Mm -hmm. Ours have been in the ground. They have, they produced they haven't produced nuts yet but I think we're getting close to yeah. it and the, and and after maybe uh, to eight ten years they're about fifteen feet eighteen yeah. feet tall. Um, if if you if this area wasn't anywhere near where you walk or your house you probably could even do the flying dragon hardy citrus um, that would could uh, might yeah. remain in, my, in there. zone eight it might mm -hmm. yeah yeah and because it's so um you know the branches are so dense and tight that could pre not as great screenage as the korean but it's another uh, an idea great thank you someone mm -hmm. just threw out another question about gumi can it be grown from seeds and what what what's what tips yeah. do you have for propagation of gumi uh, mm -hmm. i i propagate it from from cuttings and air layerings which are slicing a branch open and putting a uh a wad of soil around it wrapped in a, a dark plastic bag, uh, also pushing branches into the ground and putting yeah, a layering, of soil over yeah. it, leaving it for Super two years. Easy. That's the easiest, fast way to get it. Um, and you can take cuttings in, in, a, in a, I believe it's late fall, they go in and, and, and then the cuttings get stuck in the ground and you just leave one set of buds above the, 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 the soil. I think the layering is probably the quickest. If, the quickest, even with a medium, a small to medium sized shrub. The, the gumi that we have is sweet scarlet. It's almost double sized fruit. Mm -hmm. And that you wouldn't see that would, the seed would produce a kind of a wild seedling. You wouldn't get the quality of fruit from that. That has to be layered from from a, a you know from a cutting or from right. a, a layering great and 
Keith Miller, who asked that question, threw in a comment too, says he has trifoliate orange down in zone B7 and uses that as a citrus rootstock. So if he yeah, yeah. Can yeah. absolutely. That yeah, flying that. dragon survives here. It survived eight below zero multiple times and it survived 16 inches of snow too, several wow. times. That's great. Great. Any any last minute questions? This is the timing is just about perfect. We're at our hour, um, so thank you everyone for thank attending. You. Thank you and everyone for asking for the questions and for being here. And a reminder for people who may have joined us late that this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing on the Chelsea Green YouTube site. It may take a week for it to show up there, but if you registered for this, you should get an email reminding you, but you can also just go to Chelsea Green's YouTube. And if there were plants that you, if you joined late or plants that you forgot to write down what they were. And I'd also encourage you, of course, to pick up the book, which list includes not only the 15 that they talked about today, but a whole bunch more. So thanks everyone for joining us. Allison and Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. It was really thank great. You. I really thank appreciate you. it. Good night. Happy growing. Good night. Yeah, happy growing. And uh, one just quick reminder before we sign off, I neglected to uh, do my duty, but I guess the website is right there on the last slide. I was yeah. going to drop that into the chat during the talk and I got distracted. I was, there was so much good information that I forgot to do that, but hortusgardens.org is a good place for more information. That's the Hortus Arboretum website. So drop by there and get some more information. Thank you Thank very much, you. everyone. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night.